Uh, what's up guys and welcome to your first lecture in biology one so uh coming to you live from a nice storm here in tuscaloosa alabama we're going to see if we can get through this lecture without any power fluctuations so uh, to begin all this off i suppose we have to describe or define biology so let's do that first biology is the study or scientific study of life anything bios means living or life and anything that ends in ology ology that means a study of something logos log logic so this is biology the study of life now a couple of concepts before we go any further and that is you need to understand that all living things are composed of the same basic chemical elements as non-living things in other words, if you go and you dive down to the bottom of the ocean and you find a, a sea worm or something, and then you come up and you find a bird flying through the air, if you take a tissue sample from both of these, they'll have the same basic chemical elements and roughly the same ratios as uh, each other. For that matter, you can go and take a scoop of dirt and hold it in your hand and know that that scoop of dirt has the same atoms in it as your hand, which is holding it. We are made of the same basic materials. Okay, all living and non-living things. Uh, and Carl Sagan, I think, said it best when he says that the cosmos is within us. We are all made of star stuff. You see, the elements that make you up right now made up probably other animals or plants weeks to months to years ago. And if you want to get technical, they probably made up other people or other animals thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, they probably made up uh, the, the same basic atoms that have not left. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. The same basic atoms were probably making up things like trilobites and dinosaurs in years past. So these uh, atoms have remained and they will always remain. When you die, what was you will become something else. All right, this is just how this all works, okay? Uh, and again, all things have to obey the same basic physical and chemical properties as other things. The, the universe is designed, or um, the universe is governed by a certain set of principles. Okay, good. All right, <clears throat> biology. So, despite all the diversity, living things share the same basic characteristics. So, even like the most simplistic of bacteria versus very complicated eukaryotic organisms, we all share the same basic characteristics. Now, I'm going to run through these very quickly here, and then we're going to go into lots of detail in the follow-up slides. So, let's go through it fast. Ooh, y'all hear that thunder? <laughs> let's go through it fast, and then we'll go through and hit the details. All right. <clears throat> All living things are organized from the atom to the biosphere. Your cells have atoms in them. Those atoms are worked into molecules, molecules into macromolecules. Your cells have organelles. Those organelles work to provide a certain function for the cell, which works to provide a certain function for you. It's all organization. It's all organization. It's almost like uh, having a CEO of a company and then uh, the higher-ups and then eventually workers at the bottom. Everybody's got a job to do. Okay? Uh, it's the same concept with living things. All the parts within a cell, all the parts within you, an organism, they all have functions. And those functions are required to keep you alive. Characteristics of living things. Okay. All living things must utilize materials and energy from the environment. So for you to survive, you have to eat things and drink stuff. Okay. You must. You must. If you stop eating and stop drinking, you will die. Your cells will run out of ATP. You will cease to exist. And it's the same story with other living things. Uh, I've got tomatoes growing in my backyard. Right? If I pull those tomatoes up and deny them sediment, if I deny them water, they're going to die. We must utilize materials and energy from our environment. And the sun's very important for this. What you need to understand as we go into this is that the sun is the source of energy for our world. Everything that we are and everything that we do, it's all based off the sun in reality. Um, you had breakfast today. You had a biscuit and sausage, okay? That biscuit is made of some sort of grain that grew from sunlight, okay? Energizing photosynthetic activity. And that sausage is probably from a pig and that pig grew up eating corn, okay? It's all energy from the sun. It's corn being a plant, obviously. It's all energy from the sun. Everything that we take in as an energy source, it's all eventually coming from the sun. Uh, let's see, number three. We maintain relative constant our entire 
<clears throat> Let me try again. We maintain constant our internal environment. There we go. Uh, this is a fancy way of saying dynamic equilibrium or the scientific term being homeostasis. Okay. Homeostasis is a constant state of sameness. If your blood sugar levels go up too high or down too low, it's not going to be good for you. If your body temperature goes up too high or down too low, it's not going to be good for you. Uh, you have to maintain a relatively constant internal environment, and all other organisms have to maintain a relatively constant internal environment. Uh, let's see what else we have. Respond to internal and external stimuli. Absolutely a fact. So all living things must do this. We must have, we must have the ability to detect physical changes internally and f deal with these. We must have the ability to respond to external stimulation. Uh, you, if a uh, bug lights on your arm, you might you know, kick it away or something like that. Uh, other living things, like plants for example, if a bug lights on a leaf, perhaps the plant will manufacture a chemical to defend itself against that bug. Like, it's the same concept, we're just getting at it in different ways. We, as living things, must all respond to internal and external stimulation. Living things, number five, must reproduce and grow. We must reproduce ourselves, make a small copy, or replicate or what have you and that small copy or replicate or what have you must get larger and then be capable of further reproduction for us to sustain ourselves we I'm afraid to tell you folks have a shelf life okay we have a shelf life and when we die we must have made more of ourselves uh, for our um, population to survive and that's just how this works that's reproduction and then last but not least, all living things must have the capacity for changing over time to better suit their environments. Okay, you take a fish, you put it in an environment that's very aqueous, there's lots of water to go around, it's going to be totally happy. But if it starts to dry out, man, let me tell you, the fish that can handle the drying condition a little bit better, they're going to be the ones that survive and reproduce. Which means that their babies are going to be able to handle a dry condition more so than others. Uh, it's a very simple concept. All right. Um, and I'm going to point this tree out just because it's fascinating. Uh, this is a bristlecone pine in California, if I'm not mistaken. I would invite you to pause this and go look them up. They're very fascinating. Uh, this tree is probably two, three, four thousand years old. Uh, they get very, very old indeed. I think they found some that are up around seven thousand years old. So you can imagine that trees like this were big trees when, uh, Greece and Rome existed. Like when when uh, Egyptians had pharaohs, these trees were in California. It was amazing stuff, folks. Really, really amazing. All right, <clears throat> let's go here. All right, living things are organized uh, from the atom all the way up through the biosphere. So let's see, levels of biological organization. Yeah. So the idea is that atoms make up molecules, like a couple of hydrogen and an oxygen atom can make a water molecule, H2O. Uh, those molecules will come together to make cells. Cells being the basic functional unit of life. Okay, this is the basic unit of life is a cell. If anything's alive, it's got to have cells or be made of cells, okay? You can put together a few cells to make a tissue. That's a group of cells that kind of work together towards a common goal. Uh, you take a couple of tissues and put them together to work towards a common goal and you make an organ. Uh, bring together a few organs and put those together and make them work together towards a common goal. You make an organ system. Get together a few organ systems. You can make an organism and then it just goes up and up and up from there. Um, yeah, that's perfect. So, so let's just kind of leave it there. You are an organ system made up of organ systems. Those organ systems are made up of individual organs, etc., etc. And uh, as you go up in organization level, you end up with what we call emergent properties. Emergent properties, you, de you could define as, um, as things become more complex, they have unique properties that arise. So a leaf on a tree is nice. Okay, a limb on a tree is nice. A tree with a limb and a leaf is nice. But a whole tree with lots of limbs and a full canopy, well, that could be a nesting area for birds. That could be a breeding ground for insects. That could be a place where fruits are grown. Like, it's got emergent properties. There's other things that can happen there as a result of its unique complexity. Okay, uh, that is emergent properties. Yes, that'll work. So, um, the forest is more complicated and interesting than is a tree. That's emergent properties. All right. Ooh, that's good thunder. 
Man. All right, characteristics of life, part two. Life requires matter and energy. Now, the important bit that you need to understand from this is as follows. Is this where I want to do this? Mm, yeah, let's do it now. Okay, <clears throat> matter and energy. Let's just go ahead and knock this out. What I need you to understand is that energy flows and matter cycles. Energy flows and matter cycles. Now, what the heck am I getting at here? Uh, energy flows in from the sun to be used on this planet and then it leaves this planet as heat. It's the basic concept. Energy comes in from the sun. All of our energy that we use comes in from the sun uh, and then it leaves as heat. Think about what you do. You take uh, a plant, like a, you, go, you go eat a salad. That plant will have grown and developed as a result of energy from the sun. You consume that energy and then your body radiates heat as a byproduct of your metabolism. That is energy flowing in from the sun and then leaving as heat. Energy flows. Whereas matter cycles. Okay, the, the atoms in the ground became a part of that plant. Uh, that changes forms. That plant is then consumed by you. You change its form. You use everything you can and you eliminate the waste products. You slough off skin. Uh, you grow. You, you lose those atoms eventually. That is a flow. Okay, or I'm sorry, incorrect. That is a cycle. Energy cycles. I'm, oh, dudes, I'm totally messing myself up here because it's a storm. Let me try again. Matter cycles. Energy flows. Energy comes in from the sun and flows out as heat. Matter is constantly cycling, constantly cycling and cycling and cycling and cycling on this planet. The atoms that are on this planet, for the most part, have always been on this planet and will always be on this planet. They could be a part of you today, and 100 years from now, a part of somebody else, 10,000 years ago, a part of somebody else. Okay? It's the same atoms, the same atoms. Uh, matter cycles and energy flows. That sounds like a plan to me. Everything coming from the sun. Now, worthy of our uh, consideration at this stage are two terms being photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So photosynthesis is the process that plants use for the manufacture of uh, energy, per se. Process of converting solar energy into chemical energy in the form of a carbohydrate is what we tend to think of. Um, so that's what plants do, generally speaking, is uh, take in sunlight, green plants take in sunlight and make carbohydrates. Cellular respiration is a pro uh, process of taking those carbohydrates and making energy uh, in the form of ATP. For instance, when you eat that salad, some of the energy that was stored as a sugar from those plants will be converted into ATP, an energy storage molecule, in your tissues. Uh, a potato is a perfect example of this. There's a little potato plant on the surface, but it stores all of this sugar in a big tuber, the potato, underground. You dig that potato up and you eat it, and then you use cellular respiration to manufacture ATP utilizing it. Okay, so that's how this goes. All right, living things maintain homeostasis. That is a relatively constant internal environment. Uh, your body temperature is somewhere around 98.6 degrees. If something happens to bring your body temperature up, like you go out in bright sunlight, you'll start to sweat. Okay, you begin to sweat and that pulls your temperature back down. Or alternatively, if you get very cold, you can start to shiver and it'll bring your core temperature back up. Okay, that shivering muscle flexion actually generates massive quantities of heat that can be used to warm your system back up. That's homeostasis, folks. That's homeostasis. Maintaining a relatively constant internal environment relatively constant internal conditions. Uh, if your blood sugar levels rise because you ate a dozen donuts, uh, you'll release insulin internally that pulls that blood sugar level back down. If your blood sugar levels begin to drop, you'll release a different hormone called glucagon. It'll raise your blood sugar levels back up. Somebody's messaging me. Who knows who. All right. Uh, living things respond to stimuli. Absolutely. So uh, we must have the capacity to respond to stimulation 
in our environments. So if you're walking around the house and your kids have left Legos out at night and you step on one, you got to know to pull your foot off of that. If you grab a hot pan, you will release it immediately. That's responding to stimuli. If your blood sugar levels begin to rise, you release insulin. That's responding to an internal condition. We must be able to respond to stimuli. And it can become really way more complicated than this. You can see this in an ecological world as well. Again, this is my background and this whole life is in ecology, so you're going to get a lot of these examples. You can see natural systems responding to stimulation as well. Uh, this is called a predator-prey model, or what's referred to as a Lotka-Volterra model. Uh, and the idea is that as the number of rabbits went up in years past, there would be more big cats to eat those rabbits because they could support larger population sizes. So you get more and more big cats, and eventually there's so many big cats they start to drive down the number of rabbits. So what happens? Big cats all die off. So there's very few big cats. The rabbits don't have predators, so their numbers grow. And then lagging behind that, the number of big cats begins to rise as well until they kill lots and lots of rabbits. And once they cross, the number of big cats begins to drop as well. What you'll see here is that the numbers of big cats and the numbers of rabbits, they chase each other constantly. This is a very classic ecological concept. Okay, this is living things responding to stimulation. The population numbers actually change in regard to one another. They're responding to each other. All right, uh, ecosystems are characterized by chemical cycling and energy flow. I sort of already have said this. Uh, chemicals move from one population to another through a food chain, matter cycles, and energy flows. Yeah, we've already sort of played this game. Uh, the concept, again, is that the elements, the atoms on this planet, are non-changing. You can consume some or release some, but they're going to stay the same atoms. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. Ergo, it's always going to be here, whereas energy flows. Energy flows in from the sun, through food webs, and out as heat. And uh, without this constant feed of energy from the sun, well, we would all die in relatively short order, folks. It would be an absolute catastrophe. And it's actually happened before a time called the KT event. The KT event. So what happened at this stage is this is referred to as the Cretaceous Tertiary event. Uh, this is when a big old asteroid destroyed the uh, life of the dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs were wiped out about 70, 72 million years ago, somewhere in that uh, neighborhood. We can go and look at a... This was actually initially discovered by some geologists that were looking at rock layers, and they noticed that there was like fossils everywhere below this dark line in the sediment but then above the dark line in the sediment there was virtually nothing for years and years like nothing was alive nothing was alive uh, so what the heck was the dark line well they took a sample from it and it was iridium this is stardust in essence it's something not typically found uh, in large amounts on planet earth but if you dig down in the rock layers then about 72 million years ago there's lots of iridium in a very short amount of time I mean, couple of years basically there's all this iridium so these guys noticed this I think in uh, Europe somewhere and they're like wow that's surprising so they come out to the west in the United States and dig down 72 million years and they find the same layer and then they go to uh, South Africa and then they went to Central America and all over the place and it's the same iridium layer in other words there is a global change a global change about 72 million years ago uh, where below it there's lots of life and then above it for a long long time there was virtually nothing uh, they had this this concept it's like wow this had to have been an asteroid impact that's the only way that all this iridium would have been all over the entire planet is it would have hit and blown up and just been filling the atmosphere with iridium that eventually settled on the planet and then has been covered over as time progresses but they were thinking, man, an asteroid that big, it had to have left an impact crater. And it wasn't until, uh, I think, the 80s, maybe, when we actually found the impact crater. I remember growing up, people were not entirely sure how the dinosaurs were destroyed. Uh, but now it's very clear. You can uh, look at the Yucatan Peninsula, and uh, if you look at oceanic charts showing the, the ocean floor, there's a huge impact crater uh, that would have led to the destruction of the dinosaurs, which is pretty fascinating, neat stuff. Um, the KT event. What actually happened here is 
when the um, rock hit the planet, it put so much dust up into the atmosphere that it blocked out the sun for a few years. And by blocking out the sun, boy, it, it, no, there's no plants. No plants means no herbivores. No herbivores means no carnivores. So almost everything died. Almost everything. 95%. It's crazy. All right. Uh, characteristics of living things must reproduce and develop. Absolutely. So um, the form of reproduction is highly variable. Uh, bacteria, for example, reprodu reproduce by what we call binary fission. They just kind of split into two identical replicates of one another. Uh, organisms reproduce and differentiate and develop. Okay, so it's kind of cool. You got our caterpillar here that would form a chrysalis and eventually emerge as a reproductive stage butterfly. So the caterpillar is larval and the butterfly is reproductive. It's kind of a neat life history strategy. And then obviously us. So my, my kiddos, of which now there are three, uh, they don't look exactly like me or my wife. They are interesting little combinations of us, no two being much like the other. To be frank with you, they're all very different from one another. They are varying copies of uh, genetics from my wife and I. That is reproduction, making unique individuals. Pretty fascinating stuff. And then, of course, there is adaptation. So imagine you're a rabbit. You're hopping around a nice forest floor. You get this brown fur. You blend in well. That's good camo. Well, eventually your population spreads and spreads and spreads, and they get into an Arctic area where there's snow on the ground most of the year. That brown rabbit's going to get eaten constantly by big raptoral birds and things because uh, they are going to be more visible. Okay, They're going to be more visible. So what do you do? Well, over time, perhaps... Uh, that rabbit will grow lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter in color. Okay, The lighter colored rabbits are less likely to be eaten by birds. So they're the ones that breed and they reproduce and make young for the next generation. And then the next generation of rabbits is lighter in color. Uh, so of all of those, the lightest colored ones of these rabbits in this snowy environment are the ones that survive and reproduce. That's how you get these arctic hares, man. That's how you get them. Uh, by developing adaptations to better suit their environment. Uh, it's kind of fascinating. You can see these in the, this in what's called a ring species concept. Uh, there is an initial progenitor salamander species in Southern California. And you can go through and look at the salamanders as you progress up and around the mountains here. Okay, And they are genetically very similar here and here. Less genetically similar here to here. Less genetically similar here to there. Uh, basically these organisms spread around these mountains over thousands of years and uh, developed unique attributes that make them look quite different when you finally get back around to the other side. This is uh, referred to as uh, natural selection, so the organisms are going to change in regard to their environments, quite simply survival of the fittest. Uh, if you are a super healthy individual and another person that's of your same age is very, very unhealthy. Um, the chance of you surviving and reproducing is higher. Ergo, your genetics will be passed on to the next generation. And we see this constantly, this descent with modification. <clears throat> the classic example is the Darwin finches. Uh, there is an initial bird species found on a mainland in the Galapagos Islands, or near the Galapagos Islands. And this bird at some stage was introduced to the Galapagos. The Galapagos Islands all have kind of different habitats that are suitable for birds to live in. And if you go and look at them now, uh, their beaks are very different. So you can see all these different beak shapes. <clears throat> like this one is, uh, has specialized to get nectar out of a very specific curved flower. Uh, this one has this really strong beak now for breaking open nuts to eat the inside of them. Uh, these are set up to be able to pick at bark to get at bugs that are inside the bark. They are all from, adapted from, the same bird's initial species that have been introduced to those islands. But over time, they, via natural selection, have changed uh, their, their beak shapes to deal with the environment they've been placed in. Right? This is how it works. This is how it works. Um, you can you can see it here as well. This is kind of a neat example. So this is over just a few years. These are called peppered moths. They were called peppered moths for a long, long time because they are white in color with little black spo uh, splotches here and there. Okay. Uh, this was I think in the UK 
a couple hundred years ago mainly, but a hundred years ago as well, during the time of the Industrial Revolution is really what we're getting at. Okay, initially the trees in the UK were very light in color. And as such, being very light in color, the lighter winged moths uh, had good camouflage. They could lie on these trees and not be seen by raptoral birds. But when the Industrial Revolution happened, there was so much smut being put up into the atmosphere that it actually darkened the trees. And when the trees became, became darker, the light-colored moths stuck out like a sore thumb, man. They were very easily seen, and birds could just tear into them. And in a very short period of time, just a few years if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the moths developed a change to their external coloration to become very dark with light spots. I guess salted moths at that point, but you get my point. Um, they became very, very dark indeed. But the fascinating thing that happened is that we soon cleaned up our act and began releasing less waste into the atmosphere, and so the trees began light in color again, and guess what happened? The moths developed a light coloration yet again. Okay, so this is a very clear example of um, adaptations taking place over a relatively short period of time in this case um, so that the organism can better survive. Classic descent and modification based off of natural selective pressure, uh, placing a stress upon the organisms and the most fit survive. Townsend would say that nature is red in tooth and claw. All right, it is an unforgiving world out there, and if you, the weaker animals do not survive, only the strong survive, and that leads to this sort of augmentation. Yeah, that's adaptations. Uh, I, we can talk about mutation as well. So mutations are very fast. Okay, a very fast means of changing genetics. Like this kind of thing takes time, hundreds and thousands of years, sometimes millions. Uh, whereas mutations can be very, very fast. A classic mutation is uh, an augmentation that, that causes a organism to not be capable of producing melanin. Albinism, to be albino, okay? A deer like this, which is albino, is unlikely to survive to adulthood. Frankly, this is a miracle that this is an adult, okay, fully grown, because this animal is more likely to have been eaten by wolves or coyotes or what have you. Uh, they're easily seen because they lack the camouflage. But in a snowy environment, like this arctic hair here, here, this adaptation would have been beneficial. So sometimes mutations are good, sometimes they're bad. The idea is that they are very quickly selected upon. Not always good, not always bad. Uh, selective pressure is influence adaptation. Yeah, that's a fact. I guess we can speak on this quickly. So there's what's referred to as divergent evolution and convergent evolution. Uh, divergent evolution is what happened with Darwin's finches. This is uh, descent with modification, natural selective pressure, causing organisms to change. So you take one progenitor bird and through different environments they begin to change and look different ever so slightly and then over a long period of time they become so genetically different that they're not even capable of breeding and producing offspring any longer. Uh, by comparison, there's also convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when organisms uh, develop traits that make them look similar to other organisms, but it's only because those traits are very beneficial. I'll give you an example. So bats and birds can both fly because flying is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Holy cow! If you can fly, you can disperse and escape from predators and do all kinds of amazing things. Uh, but that does not mean that a bird and a bat are highly related. <laughs> that just means they've been placed in similar environments. The, the really neat examples of this are uh, desert plants, cacti. I guess they're both in Arizona. So the idea here is that these cacti look very similar to one another. Boy, do they look similar. But if you take a tissue sample and run their genetics, they are super, super different. Okay, super different. Uh, and... Very popular. Um, very different genetically. So they are not the same organism, but they look the same because they've been placed in the same environment. That is convergent evolution. So because they are under the exact same um, selective pressures, they have developed the same basic characteristics. And that you see this all over the place. Taxonomy and systematics. Uh, taxonomy is uh, <clears throat> basically how we identify organisms based off of their physical appearances. And systematics is how we study the relationships between organisms. Now, what all this leads to is a, a breakdown of how life is organized in the grand tree that is life, okay? 
What we tend to do is we have a uh, breakdown of the basic domains being bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and then following those domains we break things down into kingdoms, phylums, class, order, family, genus, and then eventually into species. Now you and I are in the same species. We are a homo sapiens. Homo sapiens. That means the thinking man. Okay. Uh, there have been others in genus Homo that have been quite similar to us. They're just no longer around anymore. Our cousins are all gone, all right? Uh, but we are in the same species. And basically what that means is that we share like 99.999% of our genetics with one another. Man, I'm popular. All right. We are very, very similar. And uh, then as you move towards like a genus and then a family and an order, a class, you're becoming less similar to one another way less similar, eventually leading to these big overarching domains uh, which are umbrellas for all life on Earth. These three domains represent everything that is and has ever been alive. So who is most closely, closely related? Species. Organisms in the same species are most closely related. Uh, which are least closely related? Things like the different domains. All right, so let's talk about these domains, shall we? Of which there are three, domain archaea, domain bacteria, and domain eukarya. Archaea, do, organisms in, do, do I have pictures? Good. Organisms in domain archaea are um, what we believe to be the progenitor of life forms on the planet, basically. These are what are referred to now as the extremophiles, all right? They're extremophilic organisms. They are prokaryotic. Both uh, domain archaea and domain bacteria, both of these are prokaryotic. Uh, what that means is that they do not have a membrane-bound nuclei. They do nucleus inside their cells. They do not have membrane-bound organelles. They're very simple internally. Very simple single-celled organisms. The archaeans are only found in really ridiculous environments. Amongst the prokaryotes, they are very rare and found in really crazy environments that resemble the early Earth. So you only find archaeans in these like crazy uh, sulfur ponds, like in Yellowstone or what have you. These ridiculous deep sea oceanic vents, uh, really wild halophile uh, salty environments. Uh, like the Red Sea, the Red Sea is red for a reason because it contains archaean bacteria that give it a red coloration. Um, or Dead Sea, I should say. That's improper terminology from my perspective. Uh, the Great Salt Lake in Utah, the ridges of it have like this red color from these extremophilic bacteria. These are organisms that are, uh, are specialized for really extreme, crazy... Um, early style environments. Okay, then there's domain bacteria. Okay, domain bacteria contains all of the organisms that we think of as being bacteria. So E. coli, uh, Clostridium botulinum causes botulism, you know, Staphylococcus aureus, you know, these are bacteria. And they are everywhere, man. They are everywhere. They are found on the ceiling of your place, to the ground, they are all over you. You have more bacterial cells in your body right now than you have human cells. They're just really small ones, okay? The bacteria are just everywhere. They have been uh, specialized into every environment on the planet, basically. You can find bacteria everywhere. Uh, so it'd be domain archaea, extremophiles, domain bacteria, found all over the place, very prevalent. Some are good for us, some are bad. And then there is domain eukarya, and all of domain eukarya, they are eukaryotic. That would be that they have membrane-bound nuclei, membrane-bound organelles, okay? Eukaryotic cells are just a little bit more complicated. So archaeans are tiny, uh, they don't even have, they have uh, just some DNA inside of them, not much else. Bacteria are super duper small, very simple internally. But then you have the kingdoms, these are the kingdoms of Eukarya, Protista, Animalia, Plantae, and Fungi. Uh, these have way more complexity, way more complexity than do these. Even the most simple protists are vastly more complicated than are the most complex bacteria. Okay, And these cells of protist animals and fungi and plants are way bigger as well. They are much, much larger cellular uh, uh, breakdown, right? They're, they're just more complicated and larger. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. 
is. If you're taking biology, this is something you need to know. So just go ahead and knock it out and memorize this, all right? Uh, let's go through and look at what some of this means, and we'll use ourselves and some other animals that we're familiar with to help us get a good idea of this, okay? So you are a human. A house cat is a house cat, all right? We're both in domain eukarya, meaning that we both have membrane-bound organelles and membrane-bound nuclei. Eukarya means true nucleus. Uh, we are both in kingdom animalia. We're both animals. Uh, both in phylum chordata. Now, we're way up here now. Way up. Chordata literally means have a spinal cord. Okay? The, that's how far up this is. How many animals do you know that have spinal cords? Well, they're all in phylum chordata. Now, we're both in class mammalia, so we're both mammals. We feed our young with milk. We have hair. Uh, we're in order with the primates, whereas your house cat is in order with carnivores. This is more or less a tooth thing. So you look at the, the shape and the setup of the teeth, and that puts you in these different orders. Uh, we are in a unique family called Hominidae. There are no others out there. Uh, there used to be the last cousin of ours died off about... 30,000 years ago in Europe, and that would be Homo neanderthalensis, okay? Uh, whereas your uh, house cat is in family Felidae with all the other cats, felines. Your cat's genus is Felis, yours is Homo, uh, your species is Sapiens, your cat is Domesticus. So your cat is in Felis Domesticus, you are a Homo sapien. Anytime you call somebody a, by their, their true species name, you go with genus and species. Like, I don't say, hey, you're a sapiens. No, I say you're a homo sapiens. I don't say to your cat, you're a domesticus, because guess what? Your dog is, well, hang on, that's unrelated to the stage. You would say felis domesticus. Like, here's your, your dog down here. Let's run through them real quick. So, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, okay, class mammalia, order carnivora with the teeth. Okay, family canidae, see, different from the cat, felidae for cats, canidae for the dogs, canines, right? Uh, genus canis for your dog, and your dog is species name canis familiaris, okay? Uh, big cats or panthera leo, we're just a part of nature, man. Like, if you look at the, the hand of a bat, it's got the same basic setup as your hand. Whales have a walking pelvis. It makes no sense, but they have them because they artifact they went into water secondarily. They started out as land animals. Like there's all this neat stuff out there that you can get into with biology. And it's just so fascinating and it's worthy of your time. Alright, let's go here. Uh, changing gears. So this is a good place to pause it if you gotta go do something. And then we uh, we'll, we'll begin here. Okay, so here we go. Um, the scientific method. What we're going to get at here is we're going to get at the scientific method. The scientific method is how we set up a series of questions that allows us to go through and gain knowledge. Okay, a standard series of steps you use in gaining knowledge through research. The scientific method can be broken down into the following parts. Observation, question, hypothesis, predictions, some sort of test, and then a result and or conclusion. Let me give you an example of conducting the scientific method. When I lived in North Carolina, I planted tomatoes and they would not grow. The plant would be there, but you'd get no tomatoes, man. No tomatoes. And the plants looked terrible. They were so unhealthy. So I had this genius idea. I was like, hmm, maybe they need fertilizer. Maybe the ground sucks here. So I add fertilizer, and guess what? I get tomatoes. And it worked. I was like, ah, the ground is just trash at my house in North Carolina, so adding fertilizer makes everything okay. Moment of genius. Let's look at this through the guise of the scientific method. I had an observation. My tomato plants, they don't grow tomatoes. I had a question. Why aren't my tomato plants, why aren't they growing tomatoes? I stated a hypothesis. Perhaps it's because the soil is bad. I had a prediction. If I fertilize these tomatoes and make the soil good, they're going to grow. So I run a test with data collection. I plant 20 plants. 10 of them I put fertilizer on, the other 10 I leave alone. And then my result, 
is that the tin with fertilizer grew tomatoes and the tin without fertilizer grew nothing. That is the scientific method. And the glories of this is it's repeatable over and over and over and over and over again. I have a layer of control using the scientific method if I need to use it. It's just very handy for making good, predictive results, okay? I can be pretty darn sure that my problem was fertilizer because of the way I set things up using the scientific method. We had a little power outage here uh, with the storm, and it took a little time to get things set back up. I don't know exactly where I was. I believe I've gone through the basic concepts of the scientific method. Uh, on your exam, it wouldn't surprise me if I threw a question or two out and ask you if this is an observation or a hypothesis or, you know, what kind of data something is or something, something, something related, you know, nothing terribly complex. Um, I will point out now that there's nothing about opinion in any of this. There's no opinions being based off of it. If you go and you read scientific literature, there are no opinions stated. Uh, it's all based off of... Seeing, seeing something, coming up with an idea, studying a hypothesis, predicting what will happen, running examinations and finding results. Uh, and I'll give you another little example of that, uh, dealing with freshwater crayfish. So I was up in the Natural Bridge area, north of us here in Tuscaloosa, and we were doing freshwater crustacean sampling. And I had noticed, while we were up there just doing a survey to see you know, what species were there, I had noticed that we were catching some species at night and other species during the day, which was fascinating to me because that's what we call a deal partitioning pattern. Uh, some organisms are daytime active and some organisms are nighttime active. And that had never been recorded in crustaceans, uh, to my knowledge. So me and another researcher got together and we built this research project where we would go up, or, well, let's just do this very technically, an observation. I noticed you know, colloquially, colloquially, that there was something weird happening with who was active during the day and who was active during the night in terms of freshwater crayfish. My question was, do these species display a, a deal partitioning pattern? My hypothesis was that if I trap during the day, I'll get one species, and if I trap during the night, I'll get another. Uh, roll through, we run tests. What happens is I throw traps out. Uh, when the sun comes up, I leave them out all day. Uh, when the sun goes down, I pull them, check the organisms that are there, put them back out, leave them during the night, come back when the sun's about to come up, pull the traps, find out who's there, and we do this for months. Okay, just months and months and months. Uh, yeah. That is our test. And at the end of the day, the results that we received was that there was no partitioning pattern whatsoever. When we went up and were doing sampling, it was just totally random chance that we got some organisms sometimes and some organisms others. Whenever we really tried, we did this scientifically using the scientific method, you notice that there was no pattern whatsoever. So what do you do? You take your data and you show that there was, in fact, no pattern. Because finding that there was no pattern is just as important as finding out that there was. Okay? It's just as important. Nothing about opinion. Like, in my own little brain, you know, I would have loved to have found something fascinating, but it wasn't there. So we have to report that there was nothing there. All right. Using the scientific method, we can generate these hypotheses. There are limited explanations of something. Uh, we can eventually culminate many hypotheses that have been uh, displayed as showing accuracy into a scientific theory. Joining together two or more well-supported and related hypotheses supported by a broad range of observations, experiments, and data. In other words, you have lots of people doing similar research at similar times in similar places, and all of this comes together in a broad theory, a broad scientific theory, like uh, cell theory, that, that all organisms are composed of cells. Many people work on this, and all of their data comes together to form cell theory. Okay, broad, uh, major, overarching, lots of data goes into a scientific theory. And then what we can do is to get a broad understanding of the world around us, we develop these scientific laws where you have many theories coming together to form a major scientific law like gravity, um, which have no real challenges to their validity. Now that being said, can any of this change? Of course. There are occasionally what we call paradigm shifts. 
Uh, that's where the accepted knowledge is proven false through uh, probably new technology most of the time. Some good examples of that are the good old-fashioned flat earth concept that, you know, when Columbus sailed across from uh, Europe, he was under the impression that if he went too far, he might fall off the planet because they thought the earth was flat. Eh, it's not correct by today's standard. Um, our diet, so our modern understanding of diet, is currently changing as to what's good for us and what's bad to us. These, these paradigm shifts can certainly happen. And uh, to get at one more major concept before we call it a day here is the concept of peer review. Peer review guards against bad research. All right, let me tell you a little story. So many, many years ago, I was involved in this major crayfish survey of this. Actually, you know what? Let's do a different one. Um, several years ago, myself and a colleague developed a unique crayfish trapping device. Uh, it's very hard to catch certain species of crayfish, and we developed a device that allows us to catch them with ease. Uh, so we build this thing. It was very simple. It's amazing nobody ever come up with this, but nobody had. So we wanted to publish our data so other people could use the device. Okay, so we. Uh, go and we do a pilot study, we show that it works, we put all this data together, and it was very short and sweet, it took us about a month and a half to do the actual research, and when it was all said and done, it was about a three or four page article in a uh, scientific publication. Now, very simple, very straightforward, nothing complex. Before the journal was willing to publish it, they put it through a process called peer review. You need to know about peer review, let me make that clear, okay? You need to know about peer review. We took our article, we sent it off to the journal, and they put it into peer review. Peer review is where they take the article and they send it to two, three, four people that are professionals in the field to review it, to read it, and make sure that there's nothing there that's really off the wall and makes no sense. What they would do is they read it and go over it and edit it, and then they send it back to me with edits. I go through and I address their problems if they saw any problems, I address their edits if they needed edits, and then I send it back to them, and then they send it back to me, and back to them, and back to me, and back to them, back to me. And when everyone was happy, then the paper was accepted and published. Okay? And that goes into scientific lore. I get emails every year from somebody asking questions about this trap. Um, because it's available to the scientific community now. Peer review prevents bad research from making it through into scientific knowledge. All right, And that's really all I want to say. The rest of this is, is pretty cool stuff, but it's not uh, something that I'm going to throw on your exam or what have you. Uh, this is just stuff I like to talk about sometimes whenever I've got a little bit of free time uh, during a regular semester. So let's not worry so much about that at this time. All right, uh, that's the end of our first lecture. You guys have a good day and stay safe out there. Thanks.